Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and today I have a guest interview for you. Today's guest is John Kelly. For those of you who follow the sport of ultra marathon running, or more specifically, the longer side of the sport of ultra marathoning, you're probably quite familiar with John Kelly and some of his accomplishments. Some of you may follow specifically the Barclays Marathons, though, too, which is a very popular kind of much different than normal type of event. And if you follow that, you'll definitely know John because John is one of very few people to have successfully actually completed the event, not only once, but twice. And the reason why that is intriguing is unlike most endurance events, the goal of this particular event is to maintain roughly a 1% finishing average. So what that means is there is a five loop course that goes through some pretty harsh terrain and the course gets adjusted from year to year to try to maintain that level of difficulty as things like technology, training principles, improved running just practices and knowledge of the area get better. So it's this, as John describes it in this episode, it's an arms race between the runners and the race director or Laz to kind of have that balance of this course is achievable on any given year. Meaning if someone has the right day, they will cross that finish line with a fifth completed loop, but it's not guaranteed. And some years it pans out where no one finishes other years like this year, you have a very historic showing where three individuals actually finished in the 60 hour cutoff time, one being John. So prior to this year, to give you a little perspective, there had been a drought of finishers. John was actually the last previous finisher, which came at his very first finish in 2017. So one reason I want to talk to John is he has a very interesting lifestyle, in my opinion. And I've covered this theme to some degree in the past where John's a busy guy. He is not just out there training and racing and really trying to lean in wholesale to the sport of ultra marathoning. He is a very successful guy. He's got a family with four kids. Uh, I'll read a little bit more of his kind of non-athletic career in a moment here, but I'm excited to share this one with you. So for just a little bit of background on John, John Kelly is a two-time finisher of the famous Barclays Marathon, as I mentioned in 2017 and this year in 2023. John also has wins in other long ultra events, including Franklin's 200 mile race in Texas, Montaigne Spine Race, which is a 268 mile course, has twice broke the Penine Way record and was the first man to complete the Grand Round. This feat, the Grand Round, involved 298 kilometers of running with about 25,440 meters of ascent and 640 kilometers of cycling and took him 130 hours and 43 minutes. John has a wife and four kids and is the chief technology officer of Envelope Risk, holds a PhD in electrical engineering and machine learning from Carnegie Mellon. Busy would be an understatement for John. So it is inspiring to hear how he makes it all work. And as we cover in this episode, how his view of training and competing in these monstrous events has evolved over the years. A few topics that we did touch on in some detail in this episode include mental focus for events of this length and kind of how he goes about that, how different areas of his life maybe feed into that ability to do that. Or if you look at the reverse, how that feeds into the rest of his life, his professional career and athletic career and kind of how that all merges course specificity. I was really interested in this one because I think as the distances and trains change, it becomes a little bit maybe of a different question. We'll see. I asked John for his kind of view on that gear things that is like way the Barclays marathon maybe is different or similar with gear choice and things like that. And how that plays out in the way you go about that particular event, uh, the race itself, things like when, and where do you sleep on a course like Barclays where there's really nothing to wake you up once you go to bed? Um, unless you're at the start finish, which you only touch four times over what is going to be a 60 or almost 60 hour effort. Nutrition. What are you doing out there for nutrition when you only have one aid station that has anything but water? Uh, it was a fun tra- topics. They, they were fun topics to ch- chat with John and just get his perspective on that. And he's been in the sport long enough to have some 
I think, interesting views on kind of how things are trending and how that has impacted the way that he goes about these things. So I hope you enjoy this episode with John Kelly. Before we get rolling, just a quick few announcements for you. If you are in Austin and you want to meet up, I host a group run at Mets Park, 9 a.m. You can find details to that at, at Outliers ATX on Instagram. If you are interested in any of my coaching services, you can find details to that at my website, zachbitter.com. If you want to help me share these episodes with other people and grow the show, it goes a long way if you like and subscribe on your favorite listening platform. And if you want to take it one step further, sharing an episode with your social media followers or your friends and family when you find one that really resonated with you. Before we get rolling, just a quick shout out to one of the show's primary sponsors this year. Element T Electrolytes. They are my go-to electrolyte supplement. They make a very convenient product that has these little packets that include 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Last year, I got my sweat test done, and it turns out I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes for every liter of fluid lost during a workout or throughout the day. So, I'll usually mix one of those packets in about two liters of water. If I'm going out for training sessions, I'll also use their chocolate flavor sometimes in the morning with my coffee. It makes a perfect mix. If I use like maybe half a packet of that, some coffee, some heavy cream, hits the spot, sends me out to my morning session, ready to roll. Uh, they are currently running a special for HPO podcast listeners, which is a free sample packet with any purchase. So if you go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO, you will be prompted to receive that free sample pack with your first purchase. So what that'll allow you to do is figure out, first of all, if you enjoy the product, and second of all, which flavor is your favorite. My favorites right now, chocolate with that coffee in the morning and watermelon for any of my fluids that I'm drinking throughout the day or out on workouts. So if that's any help for you, those would be a good starting points in my opinion. So head over to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO to check out their stuff. You can also access those links in the show notes or on the show sponsor website, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. All right, let's dive in with John Kelly. I'm joined today with a guest uh, after a massive human effort. John Kelly, how's it going? Going pretty good. Happy to be here. Yeah, no, it's. I'm excited to talk to you. I've uh, been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to talk to a handful of people who've done some of like the longer stuff where things like Appalachian Trail or transcontinental type stuff. And it's just, it just highlights to me just like, the aspect of ultra marathon running where we have this term ultra marathon running, which is basically just an umbrella for like very long stuff, which ranges from very long to the absurdly long. And I would say like when you're looking at duration, that's one thing, but then when you're looking at environment as well, that's another thing, but you skew maybe a little further to the absurdly long side of the spectrum. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd say that's that's definitely a fair assessment. And, you know, when you look at our sport, it's it's at least as diverse as a track and field meet. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, there's 100 meter dash. There's the two mile. There's the long jump, the pole vault. Uh, it's it's really difficult to, to compare a, a lot of these different styles and, and distances of events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that does open the sport up to such a wide range of different backgrounds, too, where you know, you don't necessarily see that kind of like trajectory into the sport like you would for maybe the marathon where there's kind of a fairly common theme of like, oh, the person did some cross country track and field and then maybe some road running, some half marathons, and then eventually arrived at the marathon. Whereas it's like, you might have someone who played division one lacrosse or <laughs> someone who like was a soccer player for most of their life and they're doing trail running and things like that now. Uh, or if we get into some of the stuff that you've done too, they may have like a big background in like ski mountaineering or orienteering of some sorts. And then since there's an aspect to navigation in some of these events, you kind of have a skill set that's going to just feed into the efficiency of it all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I ran in high school, I, I did track and cross country, but really I, 
I came back to to the sport and, and got into doing the sorts of things I do via long distance hiking and backpacking more so mm-hmm. than the running. I was I was out there in the mountains. Uh, you know, my wife and I through hiked the John Muir Trail and, and a number of other big things and I loved seeing all that, but I, I don't didn't have time to see as, as much as I wanted to. So I thought, well, maybe if I run, if I if I move a bit faster, I, I can see more of this stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you can yeah, you just push fast forward on on the on the pace and then yeah, you're gonna cover a little more ground. Uh I did wanna one of the topics I wanted to talk to you about is just like the core specificity topic because uh I find it interesting because I think like obviously when you get into these varied courses and these really unique terrains, I think it's definitely a variable that should be considered and worked with. Um, I've heard some people say like, yeah, like overall fitness is going to be the big mover and then course specificity. It's like, if you have access to the course, great, but don't overthink it if you don't. So like the common example, that'd be someone living in the Midwest going out to do something like Western States. It's like, they're probably not going to have access to like three mile descents or anything like that, that they might see on the course itself. So get as fit as you can. Don't overthink the fact that you're going to have a little bit of variance there. Versus like, you know, things like the Appalachian Trail when you're out there for that long or something like Barclays, where it's a pretty unique environment. Do you, how how important do you think course specificity is for just your overall process and results for something like a a longer event like Barclays or doing something like the Appalachian Trail? So it's... My thinking on that's evolved a, a good bit over the years. When I first started uh, doing Barkley the first time I got in, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, just kind of panicked and tried to find every hill around that I could and and do repeats. Uh, I was living in Maryland outside of Washington, D.C., so it's not like I had huge mountains to, to train on. Um, but that was my approach, and, and that was – that's been a lot of people's approach at Barclays is, is to go out and essentially power hike steep hills all day, mm-hmm. every day. <laughs> and there's, there's some value to that, but I, I think a lot of that is done at the expense of overall fitness. And in recent years, uh, and really the year that I finished because I, I was run commuting to and from my job in downtown DC every day and didn't have much choice in the matter. Uh, focused a, a lot more on maintaining my, my overall fitness, my, my speed, uh, being able to do those big climbs without hitting my red line, uh, essentially. Um, and then in the few weeks before, getting some of those big hill repeat sessions, uh, getting the repeated bout effect. Uh, but I, I look at it much more as, as kind of trying to stay fit year round uh, and then just sharpen things and, and target uh, an individual race in the weeks or, or maybe the month leading up to it. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think like that is one thing I learned with my ultra marathon run journey journey. Granted, I do much more controllable events than you do on the average, but uh, like that idea of, oh, we're running long distances, hours and hours all day, hundred miles plus and all that stuff is like one way to think about it but then it's also like the when when i had a little bit of a shift in my perception i think it was just like well what workouts are still important but maybe not as specific to the day of i should still be doing them but then maybe I, maybe i don't do short intervals 3 weeks away from a 100 mile race but i do them earlier in the plan and then 3 weeks out from the race i'm doing something a little more specific to the course environment and the intensity at which i'll be racing and Sounds like you're kind of addressing it in a similar way relative to the courses you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I've, I've especially in the past year, I've, I've shifted around a lot and what I've done from uh, last summer before I left the UK, I, I did the Wainwrights, which was five and a half days in the mountains of the Lake District. Uh, and then I, I dropped it down. I, I did a half marathon and then a marathon and then 100K on a, a relatively, uh, not, not a mountainous course, a hilly course uh, at Bandera. Uh, and then back up to, to Barkley. And so through that, uh, my my kind of core training has, has remained largely the same. And there's been some, a few specific workouts uh, leading up to each event that's kind of tried to, to hone 
uh, th that overall fitness, but uh, I think there's a lot of value in, in being able to, to do that sort of range uh, of event uh, that, that benefits, uh, you know, do, stepping down and doing a marathon was, uh, I feel, a big help uh, for, for me at Barkley and uh, going forward and, and some of the multi-day events that, that I prefer. Mm -hmm. What were those, those core workouts that you would typically do? And if I can have a follow-up question to that, are they like indicators of your fitness or are they just like workouts that you think are going to be ones that actually prepare you specifically for a race like Barclays? Uh, I, I think probably more on the preparation front. Uh, I've found, and I don't know if this is specific to me, um, the training I do, my own mindset, uh, overall life stresses that are affecting some of my workouts. But, you know, I'll, I'll go out and I'll do intervals. And so going into the marathon, there were some shorter, more intense uh, interval sessions that I was doing. But even on those, my pace was slower than what I actually ended up running the marathon in. Mm -hmm. uh, w when I had that sort of race day adrenaline competition mindset, I was properly tapered uh, going into it. And so it's, it's real easy for me, uh, unless I'm, I'm kind of comparing directly to past training runs that, that were very similar in structure. It's, it's a risk to me to, to look at a training run. And look, if I try to look at it as an indicator, think that, you know, I, I'm going to fall well short of my goals. There, there's no way I, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very much, uh, I look at it for the, the training effect itself, uh, and, and try to, to build off of that. I I've also, uh, so I mean, switching to Barkley, there were a lot more, uh, steep hill repeats, but, but nothing, the sort of thing I, I used to do where I, I'd go out for six hours of, of nothing but steep up and down, or I'd put the treadmill on, you know, 30 to 40% and just walk up it for hours on end watching Netflix. <laughs> um, you know, they'd be more normal workouts with, with maybe a, an hour or two of those steep hill repeats added in. Uh, and unfortunately I, I broke my wrist about six weeks before Barclays. So I, I couldn't do some of the specific training I wanted to do. I, I couldn't really use my poles at, at all. Uh, going into the event and so i was a, i was a bit worried that i wouldn't have the arm strength and, and using the the trekking poles on on those steep barkley climbs my arms would give out before my legs um so a lot of it is is just kind of improv on, on what there's time for and, and and what my body is is able to to take on yeah that's really interesting i think i, ha I have a couple more questions on the training preparation front but you just highlighted something that leads me into a next topic I wanted to talk to you about. So I think we'll just pivot right now and go with it. And that's kind of the mental focus for some of these longer events. And what actually gets you prepared to tackle something like Barclays, where on a historic year, you're looking at finishing just under 60 hours of, of essentially work out there sleep deprivation and things like that. And I think just like wrapping your head around something like that is so over encompassing in a lot of ways that you have to probably be prepared to compartmentalize and move through it in a way that's manageable. And I have this conversation with my wife all the time about like, what is actually preparing you for the mental aspects of these races? Cause I think a lot of times with sports, endurance racing in general, people tend to lean towards the specific things like, oh, I did this long run at goal marathon with the percentage at goal marathon pace. And that got me into the headspace that I could do this. I could wrap my head around this, gave me the confidence. It showed me I could focus for that duration of time. There's just really no way any, any one training stimulus or even a series of them are going to really prepare you for 60 hours of continual focus, mental fortitude, to get you to where you need to be on something like Barclays. So then that opens up this topic of like, well, what is preparing you for that? And I find it super interesting when I'm talking to someone like you or my wife who have like a very busy, very precise full-time career outside of the training and racing stuff you do. And then you also have the unique side effect. You have four children, you have a family. So it's like, there's just so much going on that, I mean, I would imagine that 
when you're out there at Barclay, like you might even be thinking like, you know, this isn't that far of a stretch from what my average day might be like on some case scenarios. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the mental aspect is is huge. And I've, I've definitely run the gamut on the different mindsets going in, into Barclay uh, over my attempts there. I've, I've had the early years where it was it was really an, an all consuming thing going in of you know I, I have to finish this I'm I'm scared of, of not finishing and it and it was just this this focus and this obsessiveness driving me forward. Um, after my first finish, that that motivation dropped down a lot uh, to to the point where I one year I just quit after two loops in the lead didn't want to do it uh, and and now it's it's kind of come back to a, a good equilibrium. And I would say that the best way of getting to that point where you have an effective and a healthy mindset about it going in is, is previous experience. And like you say, for something like Barkley, you can't train uh, for, for the event itself. There, there's no sort of indicator race. Uh, you know, g- going back to, to my build in the fall, I, I was, I wasn't having a great time in training. My kids kept getting me sick and kept not doing well in my workouts or so I thought. And then I did a half marathon. I did pretty well. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe this marathon will, will be all right. But like you said, there's, there's not really an indicator race, but for Barkley uh, leading into it and just having the knowledge and experience of those past races, those past Barkleys, those past events, that I can pull from to, to know, Hey, you did this before you you can do it again. You've been at a low point. Uh, you can make it through this. You can pop out of this. Uh, and also, as you say, there's, there's a lot of parallels between, uh, something like Barkley and, and actual life. Uh, you know, it's, I, I have had a, a tough, uh, startup, career uh the past few years i have the four kids and uh there have certainly been times in, in either directions where again I've, I've drawn on previous experiences and from either of those it, you know you went through this stretch with your company with the startup you can do barkley it's it's only 60 hours like in the grand scheme of things what's 60 hours and, and also going the other direction at the startup thinking you, you can do barkley you can make it through this day it's it's it will pass and and that's the being able to zoom out is is huge and think of everything that has gone into it and all the hours and the time and the effort not only from myself but from others and to think yeah like i'm out there on loop four in barkley this is awful miserable like i'm at a lowest of low points how am i possibly going to get through this and then to think it's just another 20 hours. Like that sounds like a ton relative to a race, but thinking about it relative to everything that has gone into it, it's like, it's just another day. What, what is that? It's, it's fine. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's been huge for me in, in doing these things and in, in terms of, of getting through that, that last little wall uh, to, to the finish. It's such an interesting point. And I just had this conversation with one of my coaching clients where it's like, we have this battle of there are times where you want to zoom in and there are times when you want to zoom out and your success is often based on doing the right one at the right time where like, if I'm doing short intervals and training and I'm three of 10 in I might want to zoom in and just focus on that next one versus thinking about how miserable nine and 10 could be. (laughs) But when, yeah, but then when I'm looking at just like the last, you know, 20% of a long race, I don't want to be thinking about necessarily how far I have to go to finish the race. So if I zoom out and think about the four months of time and energy and preparation that went into it relative to the last 20% of the event, it sort of dwarfs that what otherwise could feel like a big task to try to finish. And it's just this combination of choosing the right time to zoom in and the right time to zoom out and how that kind of changes your mental perception in terms of being able to kind of push through those lows. Cause it's like the other thing too, is that's really unique to these long events. I think is you ultimately get to these 
points of what perception or rock bottom. And you think to yourself, Oh, I've got long enough ways to go. I'm already down here. I can't get any worse than this. How do I keep going? But you somehow end up doing the same thing that got you there and it gets you out, which is just such a weird backwards thing in your mind where doing the thing that got you there actually brings you out of it. Seems like it would work the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and breaking things down into those chunks is uh, an enormous, important strategy doing anything of, of this length, even, you know, stuff of, of more reasonable lengths, uh, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm never going out there thinking of the, the entire task at hand. You know, I don't step to the start of Barkley and think, oh, I have to run through these mountains for uh, 60 hours and climb all these feet of ascent and and all these miles i'm thinking one one climb at a time you know i've got to get to the top of that hill i've got to get to the next book uh, i got to finish this loop it, it, things that my mind is able to actually focus on and grasp without being just completely overwhelmed and the low points can can happen early you know there was a, a bad stretch i had on loop two this year uh, and, and if I'm thinking of the entire race, uh, thinking, uh, I feel like this on loop two, and I have to get through, you know, three and a half more loops of this, that there is no way. And it's just remembering it just, just keep, just keep making it to, up the next hill, uh, to, to the next checkpoint and remembering, you know, I, I've been there before. Uh, this this is a bad time of day for me. This is uh, just a, a low spot in the race. Maybe I haven't eaten enough. Uh, and just eventually, as you say, you, you keep going forward and, and you pop out of it. So having having that ability to, to both zoom in and out uh, is, is huge. And I'll also say sometimes especially in training leading up to these things, having someone who can provide that kind of external, fully zoomed out perspective, it's so easy for us to get lost in the noise of our own life and of our own training and all of these things that we have going on and think that I can't do this. It's, it's not possible to get this done. Am I in a terrible spot? Has my training been bad? And, and so I, get, I have my wife, um, my coach, David Roach, is, is great, not only on the, the training aspects, but but on that sort of psychological psychological aspect of being able to, to step back and say, look, no, you're in a good spot. Hey, look at what you've done before. Look at what your previous workouts have been before going into these races. Um, look at all these factors. You're you're good. You, you got this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think the, the another question I have that I'd love to hear your perspective on because you sort of have the a situation where I think you can maybe highlight something about it is just this, it's almost a chicken or an egg type of question where like you have a, a busy, successful career, you have what I'm, I'm sure is a busy, successful running side of like your life too. And I know of like a lot of times the conversation and the question I'll get a lot of times too is like, well, what like life um, what, what type of like life processes or efficiencies or value adds do you get that aren't the specific preparatory type timeline of running that you translate into something completely different? It's like, oh, wow, I can kind of take this template from preparing for a race and executing a race and I can place this into my business or I can place this into the way that I set up kind of the efficiencies within my, my general life and things like that or an order of operations to some degree. And I tend to have been be the type of person where I feel like I've probably learned more from running and applied that to other areas of my life. But I also can appreciate that there's a lot of people that maybe have done that in a reverse order where they had other areas of their life that kind of sorted out a process that was like, okay, this is the way to kind of, this is the scaffolding, so to speak, and then applied that to their, their training and racing approach. Is there any variance there for you within that? Or is it kind of maybe a combination of the two feeding into one another? I would love to hear kind of your perspective of how those have evolved over your career as a runner and as, as a professional. Yeah, they definitely feed into each other. Uh, but like you, I think that overall, I've probably taken more from the running 
uh, applied to my what I'll say my my actual life, um, my job, my family, uh, and and for a lot of the things I do, honestly, that's that's kind of my my goal or the the justification for spending the time out there away from my career and my family doing those things is that I'm going to come back from them better. Uh, I'm going to be improved and I'm going to be able to, to take that time uh, th that I have with, with my family and my job and uh, be much better at it to, to make uh, better use of it. And so I've, I've alluded to that on, on a lot of race reports I've done in the past uh, with I feel like I've I've kind of been vague. Uh, I'm I'm actually currently now going through a, a series of of posts on my social media of the specific lessons that I've I've taken away. And so, two of the biggest that that I've done so far is is one don't don't waste energy and and time on the things I, I can't control. Uh, another is to to go for progress be, before perfection, which has been incredibly hard for me, uh, especially. Uh, in, in my career, the type of technical work I do where I'm, I'm modeling and developing machine learning models and, and trying to fit things to data. And, and there's always this temptation of, oh, I can do just a little bit more, just a tiny bit more. And, and you hit this point of diminishing returns where, you know, you're, you're wasting your time. You're, you're preventing yourself from actually moving forward. And so uh, there's there's so many things uh, that, that I've taken away that uh, have, I feel, been instrumental in me going from, uh, in my running career, in terms of going from uh, a Barkley finisher in 2017 that was uh, a, a bit overly uh, obsessive with, with trying to get everything right and, and being this sort of all-consuming mindset at the expense of the other areas of my life to this year where it's just like, I enjoyed it. There was no stress, there was no anxiety. I, I, I went into it with a great mindset. I, uh, you know, I, of course there's some low spots, but in general, I uh, authentically enjoyed my time out there, the actual type one fun. And so those sorts of things uh, have, have, have made me a better runner, uh, have, but have also uh, really made me a better father a better husband a, a better data scientist and and yeah like you said there is some cross-pollination there of of all of those things uh influencing the other but i feel like the vast majority of the flow is going lessons learned from running <laughs> applied elsewhere and again to me some of the things i do i, I don't know if, if they would be worth it to me if i didn't get those takeaways from them mm -hmm. I recently had uh, Pam Smith on the podcast. I did a two-part episode with her, one to just outline kind of her career in ultra running because she's she's interesting to me in the sense that she's kind of had a very wide range of types of ultra marathons that she's been successful at. And then one of them that stands out to a lot of people, I think, is when she won the Western States 100 in 2013, was ninth overall. It was one of the hotter years. And she's had like a really, some really fun write-ups after that one, just talking about kind of how she dealt with the elements that day. And the other interesting thing about Pam is, you know, she had, she's full on career um, as a doctor, a family. So I was just curious about just what went into the preparation for Western States or any of her preparations really leading into a big race like that. And the way she kind of spelled it out was that first thing she did, she sat down and she just identified the non-negotiables. Once she had the non-negotiables, she built from there. So like, she knew like for her priors in life, obviously her job was a non-negotiable, like staying true to her family and making sure everyone was, everything was fair and, um, you know, heading in the right direction in that department. And then that left some time left that she had to decide, like, I, do I want to use this time to train and what do I have to sacrifice to do that? And she said that one of the bigger differences between Western States and maybe some of her other ones is you know, she took that portion of her day just a little more like I'm going to make some compromises on maybe like, you know, watching 30 minutes of TV or reading a book I would normally read that aren't going to be something I have to sacrifice forever. But during this four months, I'm going to push that stuff off the side and make sure I spend that training for Western states uh, and really just make sure I check that box and make 
that section a little bit more of a non-negotiable as well because I made some space for it. And I thought that was really interesting because it also opened up this, I think, this scaffolding of her schedule too, where she knew in order for her to move through that schedule she built up with those non-negotiables, she didn't really have the flexibility to say like, oh, I, you know, I've got this this run to do today, but I think I'm going to push it off to later in the day because I feel like it would be better. Then there was not even room for that sort of conversation in her head. It was, I wake up, I've got this two hour window to do my training session because after that I'm going to work. And after work, I'm going to pick up the kids from school and I'm going to do this with the family and that sort of thing. Do you, do you see that in the same way? Or do you have a similar process where you kind of like outline things? Like these are things that just, just have to get done in order for me to complete the stuff that I want to do in life and then build the training into that in a way that's going to best match that? Or what is kind of the process on your end? Yeah, uh, my my calendar is is king. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, I try to put pretty much everything on there. Uh, I, I have a daily schedule. Of, I, I kind of block off, you know, th- this is my time window for, for work calls. This is my time window for, for deep work. Uh, this is when I, uh, I'm, I'm hanging out with kids or, or family stuff. And, and then this is, is where my run squats in and, and otherwise I find it just way too easy to let those things slip, uh, to, to not start them in time or to let them bleed into one another in, in a way that I, I don't want to do. So that has been that's been really important for me, not only in in being effective at those things, but also just reducing the, the stress and anxiety around them of, you know, when am I going to get this done? When when am I going to do this other thing? Am I going to be able to take on this task? Uh, It's, it's all there. I don't have to think about it. Am I, uh, I'm looking at it right now on my, my other monitor. There's, there's my calendar. There's what I'm going to do. It's just, uh, going to ding me with what comes next. And and that's that. No, no thinking or worrying about it. So at this time I'm hanging up on Zach. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I love to hear that. I think there's like, there's a certain amount of a piece in the order that comes with just having like a busy schedule to some degree where I think like, I find like sometimes I'm most satisfied when I am busy because there is that, that there's, there's, you just eliminate so much noise that could put creep in if you have a little more flexibility and i think there's you obviously need breaks from that from time to time too probably but like for the on average i find i'm the most satisfied i think in that sort of a environment to some degree too um when you do get to like the part where you're like okay here's the outlook i have or the, the 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 bandwidth the time i have to build out a training program for whatever it is you're going to do. Obviously, most recently Barclay and historically have been a priority race for you, it seems. Um, are you weaving in any sort of cross training to any degree or strength work or anything like that? I think one thing I find really interesting about ultra marathon as well is since when you get into the world that you're in, there is such a variety of mechanics. And I think there's also an application of just like moving in general tends to be a little bit more of a direct feed into what it's going to do for you on race day than versus the very specific nature of preparing for some of these more Olympic distance events. Yeah, those are things that I I've been saying this for, for years now, and I'm, I'm eventually going to have to, to make a change here, but I, I wish that I could do more of them. Uh, I, I have a, a few short routines. I, I, I try to do periodically for, for strength training, some things I can just do while I'm on a non-video work call or or the like. Um, I'm not able to do cross training as, as much as I'd like. I I love my bike. I I love getting out on it. I'm just, I live a few miles from the Blue Ridge Parkway now, which would be just beautiful to ride on, but I I haven't had time for it. And and so again, that kind of falls down in that list of, of here are the things below those non-negotiables here are the things that I would like to do uh, one day if I get time. Uh, but until then, I'm, you know, I have to get my actual running in. I'm not yet hitting diminishing returns on my run training volume. You know, I'm, I'm doing 60 to 70 miles a week uh, most of the time, very 
maybe once or twice a year. I get that up in the 90 to 100 range, but but not very often. And so any additional time I, I have for training needs to be added for that. One day, again, I think especially as I get older, I'm, I'm going to need to be sure that I do have a bit more strength training and, and cross training in there. Um, but it, it is what it is now. I have my my family time, my career, and and my running, and that that pretty well eliminates the possibility of not only any strength or cross training, but any uh, additional hobbies or anything that that might uh, eat away at, at that time. And that sort of thing isn't for everyone. Uh, you know, that's that's not to say there's anything wrong with having uh, a lot of different hobbies that you spread time between. But for me, for for my focus, for my own goals and, and what I want to do, uh, I, I just I don't have time for, for those other things, whether it be uh, cross training that, that I would enjoy or going to get drinks with friends or, you know, going to play a round of golf or watch TV or, or whatever the, the other things are that, that people uh, spend the majority of their time on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You sort of whittle away at some of that stuff, I think, as you identify what your kind of main priorities are. And obviously sometimes the, you find yourself finishing Barclays twice, <laughs> maybe <laughs> some priorities flare up at where others diminish a little because of some of that stuff. Uh, I do want to uh, kind of transition a little bit and you've done a great job, I think, of sharing some of the stuff about Barclays and just like your other races and things like that along the way with some of my questions. Um, but like specifically to the event and there'll be some people who listen to this podcast who aren't super familiar with the event itself. Um, then there'll be the people who are very familiar with it, but uh, we don't have to get into the all the specifics of the event. Uh, but I think it's just such an interesting play on that Laz when he sort of evolves the course from year to year you mentioned something on another podcast I thought really interesting where I think people look at it sometimes they think like oh yeah okay here's this guy making this of course it's like darn near impossible to finish but it's not that simple because what you said was it'd be very easy to make a course that was impossible to finish like you can always just make it too hard to get there like reduce the cutoff time to 40 hours and then make the course even harder. Like no one's finishing then, but the balance is making it just hard enough. So like it's very difficult and a lot of years, no one finishes, but there's still a chance. And I want, I just want to hear your thoughts on that as well as how that evolves with the sport, because as the sport grows, we have like different things like better nutrition practice, better equipment, um, you know, now that Barclays has gotten a little more popular and folks like yourself have had a chance to do it multiple times, you just have more experience out there. How have you sort of seen the race kind of like ebb and flow with the introduction of new things, um, new people in order to make that kind of set up the way it is where you have a situation like Barclays ends up playing out where even on a year like this, where three people finished, it was like, none of you were like way ahead of the cutoff time or anything like that. Yeah, it's it's one of the most interesting aspects of the race to me. Uh, the, the way that it's set up, it is designed to where you know he, he wants about a one percent finish rate, and has has hit that uh, approximately uh, over the past thirty five years or so. And in the early days, uh, twenty plus years ago, yeah, the course was significantly easier, uh, but those people were running around with like carbide mining torches and <laughs> fanny packs and hiking boots and like no run nutrition it was uh no, no trekking poles uh and, and so as people of you know we get now we have led headlamps now we have good trail running shoes now we have poles now we have nutrition now we're smart and know how to actually train for this thing as those things have progressed, uh, rather than there just being more finishers and the times getting faster and faster, that the course has gotten more difficult to adjust to that. It's it's a bit like an arms race. Uh, and again, if, if the goal is to keep it at, at 1% finisher rate uh, to where it kind of maintains that carrot on a stick appeal for everyone, that that's the real goal. Like the 
the, the quantifiable goal is we want 1% finisher rate. The, the more subjective abstract goal is we want everyone reaching for their absolute limits and, and beyond. And if you have it to where some people can finish in, you know, under 50 hours, that they don't have to do that. It's, it's uh, they go out there and they, they do it, they finish. It's, it's not a problem. They don't have to really worry about uh, making mistakes or weather or anything else. They just go out and, and do it. And, and they don't have that experience of really getting stripped down to their core and uh, really focusing on, on what they can do. Uh, to get this done and, and what how they can improve to, to get it done. And so, you know, in, in the years that I've done it, so about 10 years ago, there, there was three people finished, then, then two people finished the next year. Then the year after that, uh, he made, Laz made a big course change that Jared Campbell said added about 40 minutes to, to each loop, which is, is huge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, there have been some small adjustments, some bigger adjustments uh, in the years that I've done it. In 2019, he made an addition that I think it's still, it would have been possible with the, the perfect person having the perfect race and perfect conditions. But in my opinion, it, it went slightly too far. Uh, and, and so that was the course for 2019 and 2021. And then last year, he, he slightly brought it back to it, to what I thought was a very reasonable course to hit that 1% finish objective. Uh, and even where it is now, uh, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, three people finished. He's going to make it so much harder. <laughs> uh, I, I don't I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see because, you know, one of those three, my, myself, was was a previous finisher. Uh, one of the other three finished with the smallest margin ever, just six and a half minutes. That's seven seconds per hour. He takes an hour and seven seconds instead of an hour for each hour of the race. He, he doesn't finish. Mm. It's, it's nothing. And then on top of that, we, we had the best Barkley conditions I've ever seen. And in general, you know, the people, the top people, the people that are, are aiming for the finish conditions don't have an enormous effect on them. Uh, it's it's not going to, to just end their race the way that some people perceive, because it, there's almost always bad conditions. The first year I finished, the conditions at the beginning and the end were, were horrible. They were atrocious. We had a 1.40 a.m. start time and rain and fog. Uh, and, and finished in cold, rain, muddy conditions. But that does have an effect. Um, and so the danger, if he makes it significantly harder next year, you, you don't want to make it to where you have to have perfect conditions in, in order to finish. Uh, you want to make it to where, you know, on with average conditions, it's possible to finish. With great conditions, it's slightly more possible. Um, and with with horrible conditions, it's unlikely, but but maybe someone could still pull it off. So I don't know that it'll it'll get significantly harder. We'll, we'll have to see that. I, I don't get to decide that. It, and that's what makes Barclays anticipated every year. <laughs> it's like everyone wants to know, but you don't know until you find out. Uh, that was great. I think you answered my next follow-up question, which was what I was going to ask. What you thought, Laz, if he was going to make a, if he was going to really ratchet down the difficulty of the course, it sounds like you think like he's going to consider the the historically good conditions this year and likely think like um, chances are with normal conditions, there won't be three people coming in under that 60 hour limit again. And that might take care of itself. But uh, it's just I mean, it just it adds to the intrigue of his job, too, as the person who has to make that decision, because there's no clear right answer because he can't control the weather and it could change days before the event. So there's that part of it. Yeah. And the, the other interesting thing, and I, I don't know how much he, or if at all, he takes this into consideration uh, when designing the, the course or if he already has it designed by this point in time, but, but who it is that's coming back. Mm. And so this year, the first two loops, we, we had a few really strong groups up front with strong veterans in, in each group uh there was i think about a dozen of us uh, stretched across three different groups and, and it had 
uh, Jared Campbell, Carl Saba, myself, uh, Guillaume, like people that, that really know the course, know what they're doing, uh, stretched out amongst these 12 people that really, uh, time-wise, that, that all of those people were still capable of a finish uh, late into the second loop. And of course, that doesn't mean you expect everyone to, but it just, um, it really increases the odds when you have strength and experience up front like that. And and the really interesting thing to me, though, is is that from uh, all of that, with, with that experience distributed a- across a few different groups, the, the three finishers, uh, Aurelian, uh, Carl, and myself, we, we didn't run together. Like, hardly the entire, I think Carl and I did the first two books together mm-hmm. on the first loop. Other than that, we were we were separate the, the whole time. I was with Damien Hall and, and Albert uh, Herrera Casas and Christoph uh, Nanorg the, for most of the race. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting just to see how that plays out and how you how everyone kind of feeds off one another. And part of a kind of a follow up question to that theme that I found really fascinating. I think it was you that said this was I mean, you're out you're going around and you're gathering these you're, you're taking a page out of a book to show that you hit a, a check mark, essentially, so you can go back down and show the last that you were actually on the course. That's how wild this is. It's not like your average ultra marathon where there's a fairly clear trail and ribbons galore that are kind of telling you where you're going and GPS tracking and all that stuff. You don't get, you get none of that out there. So you get a show of pages that you went where you went. And I mean, it's a, an event where if you're successful in beating the course, you're still out there for nearly 60 hours. People are going to intuitively think, I think like there's gotta be some sleep in there, but how do you manage that? And you mentioned uh, like your watch, which is basically just your, your, a cheap, digital watch that shows the time because that's what you're only allowed to have yours didn't even have an alarm oh you still have it <laughs> yeah it's, it happens to be sitting right here and and it it does it has an alarm on it and this this is it made it actually worse it claims to have an alarm and but when the alarm goes off just the display just blinks oh. it doesn't make any noise i don't know if the speaker on the watch is broken or, or what the deal is but i i kept trying to figure out how to set the alarm because it 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 has one mm-hmm. but it, it wouldn't work and so i actually at one point on on loop four i i kind of wandered off course and lost some time because i was distracted trying to set the alarm on the watch oh man yeah so it's like yeah and it's just like a kind of like this is a little bit of a of a pivot but it's like you have these situations where like you almost have to be as mistake free as one can expect. Because if you, I mean, if you look at this, obviously wasn't quite your situation, but a seven minute difference between finishing and not finishing, like a mistake like that's the difference between finishing and not finishing. Um, It's just mind boggling to think about, but in terms of like the, the taking a nap, it's like you talked about, you'd get to a book and you would lay down on the book because you knew it couldn't be too long before someone would come through to need to get their page out. They'd have to wake you up. And that's how you would kind of make sure you didn't sleep for so long that you end up getting cut off the course. Yeah. Uh, that was a new one for me this year. That was, uh, really just enabled by there being so many people still out there on loops three, four, and and five, uh, in previous ones that I've done by the time I get to that point that I'm that sleep deprived, that's not an option. Like there's, <laughs> um, there's not enough people out on the course to, to rely on that. And so on loop five this year, I was trying to push as far as long as I could. Um, Aurelian and I were going in opposite directions. And so essentially I was, I was trying to get as close to the halfway point as I could before I went to sleep on a book, uh, hoping that, you know, if he was having a decent loop that he would get there and yeah, wake me up in time for me to still be able to finish. Uh, but you know, if, if he had a terrible loop or, or maybe he thought that he could have thought the same thing, you, yeah. you know, we, we, we could have been at consecutive books with him sleeping here, waiting on me to get to him and me sleeping here, waiting on him to get to me. And, and so it is a risk. There's unknowns with that. I didn't know that Carl was behind me uh, at that point. And so, it, but I was to the point where I was just staggering and stumbling along. I, I couldn't focus. I, I couldn't move with any sort of speed. And and I had to take that risk. 
Yeah. It's so, it's so insane what your mind goes through and what you have, like, you know, there's the risk there, but it's also, it's sort of like a kind of like there's two sort of less than ideal situations and you have to pick one. And it's like the one that seemed more possibly detrimental was trying to continue on that much like sleep deprivation and lethargy where you find yourself like, you know, really bad situation where your body just shuts down on you. And then you, then you're, then you're out and you're, you're not controlling anything at that point. Yeah. And that's, that's again, something I've, I've learned uh, over the years uh, through Barkley, through other multi-day things. I, I've had some races where I've handled it quite poorly. My first time at, at Tour de Giant, my sweep strategy was, was awful. And I slipped from the podium down to like 16th, uh, I think by the end of the race, just from, uh, I ended up napping everywhere uh, on the trail at the aid stations, just uh, anywhere. Mm. I was, I was asleep, uh, just repetitively, uh, towards the end of that. So uh, I don't think that you can train yourself to need less sleep or not need sleep, but you can definitely learn, uh, what to expect, uh, and how to manage that, how to best nap, uh, for, for your own personal physiology, when you have those low points during the day, uh, when to properly time caffeine, mm. uh, th those are all things that, that can definitely help, uh, get through those moments. Do you have a caffeine protocol where you're like, I'm going to wait till I feel a certain sensation to introduce this. And then is there like a limit where you're like, but I can't go past this or it just becomes too repetitive and loses its effect or creates negative circumstances as versus positive ones? Uh, yeah. So I, I drop all caffeine. I go cold Turkey on caffeine two or two or three weeks before these things. Uh, God bless my wife for making <laughs> it through the, the first couple of days of that. Um, so then, you know, my, uh, when I need to use it in the race, I, I want it to, have as much effect as, as possible. And so I'll hold off on it usually, uh, for the first day, most of the first night, sometimes I, I go through the first night entirely without it, but I do know that I have this low, I have two low points every day, late afternoon around 4 PM and just before and after sunrise. And so if I'm starting to, to fade a bit going into one of those low points, then, then like I might take some caffeine just before sunrise on the first night to, to push me through that, to kind of vault me into the next day. Um, but then I, I do try to, to use it strategically until the last day. And then once I get on the last day, it's just, yeah, it's, it's coming in, um, mainline it, <laughs> but yeah, pretty regularly. I've got those, uh, I used to have gum and, and, pills which uh, but now that the martin gels they they have ones with 100 milligrams of caffeine which is quite okay. legit caffeine instead yeah. of the the 25 that the most have and so uh use use one of those uh every few hours to push me through that last day but there is that risk that if you use too much uh you 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 can kind of get a bit disoriented and also uh, it can really wreck your stomach. And if it wrecks your stomach, then you can't get in calories mm. and calories are again, an important thing to, to keep you awake. Sometimes if you start to drift off and, and feel sleepy, it's it, just getting in more food might mm -hmm. do the trick uh, rather than the needing to get in calories. And the two other kind of strategic things I'll, I'll mention on, on caffeine is, most sources of caffeine take like 15 to 20 minutes to really kick in. So if you're going to go down for a quick nap, whether it's a dirt nap on the trail or at an aid station or, or whatever, take some caffeine right before you go to sleep. And then you wake up, the caffeine hits you right as you wake up. You've got that combined with the nap and it's, it's really a, a good boost. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I try to do at Barkley, if I feel myself fading a bit coming into camp, I, I take one, uh, before I come in because I do not want to hit camp at a low point. Camp is such a temptation. Like it's a great support point, but you get there and it's just, it's so nice and comfortable mm -hmm. and you have what you need. And it's just, 
if you're already at a low point and you're presented with that stuff, you know, it's like you're famished and you come to a feast and you're like, yeah, I think I'll just stick around yeah. for a while. Uh, I, I don't need to, to go back out there. And, and so I, I try to avoid that. Um, try to come into camp uh, feeling good and, and motivated uh, to, to keep myself from sticking around too long. Yeah, you know, it sounds like you've turned over as many rocks as one could imagine on this course, including the ones that have books under them. So <laughs> it's so fun to hear you talk about that stuff. Uh, you've mentioned some stuff about nutrition. I think maybe we can end if you have like, I, I would just love to hear how you're navigating that because like, my, my thought process is like, you know, you're out there for nearly three days, you're bypassing roughly nine normal meals potentially. And then there's the, obviously like this, the snacking and stuff and the sports products that you're going to use to try to get through something like this. But on a course like Barclay, like, am I understanding properly? Like really you have to stock up at the beginning of each loop and then you don't really have access to fuel after that. At that point, you have some water options, but nothing else. Yeah, that's, that's the case. And so that's something that uh, another thing I, I've improved a lot, uh, through the years and also just my body has changed through the years, uh, stuff that at one point worked for me no longer does. Um, and, and I've learned a lot again through, through these, uh, previous experiences, but, uh, this year it was, it was, went pretty well other than loop two. And, and I, again, that's where I had a low point. It was really cold. Uh, on that loop. Uh, I mean, we were having up top, uh, down in camp, it was like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And so up top, it was probably in single digits and then add wind chill on top of that. And it's really easy to think, you know, uh, I don't want to take my gloves off. I don't want to get in my pack. My hands are going to get cold. And also I, I think that just a lot of the variance in the conditions, like going from I'm really cold to now I'm climbing the backside of this mountain and I'm hot. And I think a lot of that back and forth kind of does a number on my stomach. So I didn't eat much uh, on that loop. Otherwise, I did pretty good. Um, so I, I relied on on tailwind throughout. I mean, pretty much every time I, I filled water, um, I, I had a, a packet of that. So, I mean, we're talking... 30 plus packets of that throughout the race. Um, again, that the, the Martin gels I've, I've found uh, work really well for me. Uh, supernatural fuel, I guess, is my other engineered one that I kind of tried to start loops with uh, is it's, it's nice and, and filling, um, but not as uh, dense as some of the other options that I would want to carry with me. And then just filling in the blanks with um, snack food, w whatever my, my body really starts to craving. Uh, and so that's that's where it's important to have variety uh, and important to get some heartier stuff in camp where I have the opportunity to try to make up for some of that caloric deficit and then let things settle on that first big climb uh, back out of camp. But that's where, you know, my crew, John Fegbressi, was bringing me stuff from Sonic and, and pizzas and, and all sorts of stuff uh, to, to try to make up for some of that deficit. Because like you said, it's, it's not just like, hey, you're, you're burning X number of calories per hour uh, out there. Like you're skipping meals. You're, you're mm -hmm. skipping entire meals for, for multiple days at a time. So you, it, it's very helpful. Uh, I'm not going to say necessary. Um, all of us have a, a lot of fat stores built up that, that we can tap into, uh, but just mentally it's, it's very difficult, uh, to, to go through that without, uh, being able to, to take in a, a good amount of, of nutrition. Yeah. I mean, it would be like mind boggling to see everyone's fat oxidation rates after that effect. <laughs> it's gotta be driven up from necessity to some degree. Uh, but it seems like, yeah, it's, I mean, sounds like about as good of a process you can hope for on a sit with, with the requirements of that event is try to get your meals at camp and then lean on more kind of refined sports product type stuff that is easy to pack and easy to carry with you that aren't going to add too much hurdles to get over from an application and a carrying capacity standpoint. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fill it up with, with stuff that, 
that you enjoy that, that appeal to you. Uh, mm -hmm. cause again, there there's good calories. There's like engineered sports calories and then there's not as good calories and then there's no calories. So mm -hmm. when you get to that point where like your stomach's starting to turn, nothing is sounding good. Like getting anything in is, is better than getting nothing in. So, you know, like Snickers, little Debbie cakes, uh, I always find it a good measure uh, if if after the race, if I look at my leftovers and I'm like, ooh, yeah, I'll have some more of those, yeah. then, then I had the right stuff if I'm not like nauseous and, and can't even stomach the thought of it anymore. Yeah, that's interesting for sure. Well, John, I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's been awesome to hear your perspective on this sort of stuff and everything that kind of goes with it. So thanks a bunch for, for taking some time out of your busy schedule and sharing that with us. Yeah. Thanks so much. Enjoyed the chat. Take care. You too. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this episode sponsors are my friends at LMNT Electrolytes. They have a wide range of electrolyte supplements and are currently offering listeners to this podcast a free sample pack with purchase. If you are interested in checking them out and letting them know that you came to them through here, you can go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO or to the show sponsor landing page, which is just zackbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Links to that are in the show notes as well. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 